we heard so much in the last session. I want to take, uh, take off from there. We heard about quiet quitting, Gen Alpha. I didn't even know Gen Alpha exists. Um, uh, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with uh, the idea of Gen Alpha and what are they looking for in life? Apart from, yes, please. I think, um, I think we have to look at different generations differently. Mm. Like Chris pointed out, the expectations of different generations are different. But I think, to, in my view, what is more important to look at, what do they need to have to be able to, to do a great job and be successful in whatever they do, and which comes back to skills and yes. capabilities and stuff like that. I think that should be an equal focus area. And to the point of Gen Z's expectation, organizations also have to adjust to expectations yeah. of its people. There's no running away from that. It's a two-way street. Right? You do a, to the question that a young lady asked, uh, I think that if you are laid off, you should get into the mindset that it is a loss to the company. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's the way to look at it. And the, the company should be worried about that as well. So I think two-way adjustments will happen as we go along, as generations change and their expectations change. And we'll talk a little more about skills later. Yeah, but you know, uh, I think the basic, will always remain the same. You know, the three things that you've talked about, courage, curiosity, responsibility, those will ch not change, right? Across generations, those basic uh, elements to your personality that you need to develop have to remain the same. Uh, back to differ a little bit. I, I've okay. changed my own thoughts <laughs> on courage, curiosity, and responsibility. I thought uh, they were quite lovely uh, uh, elements. Absolutely. No, they're key elements, but I also think uh, things have changed a little bit. Now I've got this new frame called ABCD of skills. Oh, please tell but, us you know, about it. Uh, but the previous gentleman, including the chairman uh, of UGC as well as Chris, stole away some of these thoughts, <laughs> but I will still reiterate them. I think it's easy to remember them as ABCD of mm. skills. The first one is adaptability. I think both of them talked about right. adaptability. The world is changing so fast that what you learn in an education institution will, you, will very quickly get forgotten and you have to upskill, you have to adapt to new right. changes. That's one is adaptability. And the second is agility, the two years. Because everything is moving so fast. I mean, what used to be done in six months, people are saying, can you do it in six hours? Yeah. Right? You, you need to be able to, you need to be very agile. So adaptability and agile are the two A's. The second is basics. I think the chairman talked about. And the basics can, can be different for different roles in the organization. If I am a software developer, the basics for that is very different. Uh, similarly, depending on the role that you perform, the basics will be different. But basics are foundation. I mean, without basics, you can't build on anything. There, I still have two C's. I've retained the curiosity part. But uh, the two C's are curiosity, because curiosity, in my view, is a cornerstone of learning. And I think, it, and you look at, look at children, they learn fast because they're very curious. I think whatever education pedagogy we do, we'll have to ensure that curiosity doesn't get suppressed. Mm. Because if that's it, that gets suppressed, then learning goes out of the window. So one is curiosity, but the second is collaboration. Mm. Right. I think collaboration is becoming extremely important because we all realize that no one person can solve anything. You need teams to work together. And collaboration doesn't come naturally for most of us. Yeah. I, have a, I have this theory saying that, you know, in India, from the day you are born, you are told you have to get two more marks than this guy. Exactly. Right? Because there's so, so much of competition, competition at every level. Competition is built into your DNA. It's so a I, function of shortage. Relative function. grading. And yeah. if, if 21 years you are told, or 18 yeah, years yeah. you are told you have to compete, and suddenly you come to an organization and say, now you collaborate, you think it's going to happen naturally? No way. It's not going to happen. So it needs conscious effort to make people yeah. collaborate. Those are the two C's. And the D's are three D's. Digital, digital, and digital. <laughs> and I think, like Chris pointed out, I think we have, I, our innate ability of our people to adapt to technology is very high. Hmm. UPI is an example, Aadhaar is an example. There are many examples that we can give. But it's important to not lose the fact that the next generation of people, we have to equip them to be able to do much more higher technology. Right. And that becomes important. So I think these are the four ABCDs of Lovely. skills that I think is important. Let's take off from there. And um, um, sure. you know, I'd like to ask you, uh, you we've also just emerged from two years of COVID. And uh, I was reading what you wrote about the tremendous loss of learning that we've experienced, especially at 
the very very yeah uh, when kids are very young not just loss of learning loss of nutrition so many other things mental health uh, suffers so we are dealing with uh, i don't know what to call this generation but it will be a very different generation when they come to uh, high school perhaps so how do we handle this and what what are the ways that we can address these uh, uh, you know these two years sure uh, thank you so much it's not just about the two years two years there definitely been loss of learning especially for those kids from rural areas yeah. who didn't have access to online education other stuff but what i'm more bothered is about the mental state that hmm. these children are yeah. uh, you know the the confidence which which they face right i mean i'll i'll quote an example so i was to my school where my kid studies and the teacher said something that stuck in me she said uh, you know as usual the kids didn't do homework or something so i asked this guy why didn't you do your homework the way i do normally do and the kid was just staring back at me not knowing how to answer two years back the same could kid would have given excuses Yeah. You know, he would have invented something new or he would have found a but this part of not knowing how to react to situation happened because he and she was not you know in a community yeah. or a cohort there so coming back again so it's not just the uh, loss of learning but i think what we need to understand is the pace of the change mm. it's not the change that is so daunting change has been happening all along but i think there is a sudden acceleration in the way change happens right um again going with the same example or similar one such i was trying to explain to my son what how is how old is he he is 17 years old and i was trying to explain I what i love how we use our children as guinea pigs <laughs> i do it all the time <laughs> i know they use as guinea pigs that's different okay anyway so i uh, i was trying to explain to him what is a branch of a bank right right in in my previous generation our generation we used to live and swear by the bank manager who used to be a lifeline it was very difficult for me to explain yeah. that banks have a branch physical, and a lot of activity happened there because in his world everything happened online so the change the shift the pace is something that we should be cognizant of and my worry is are our educational institutions keeping pace with that change are we changing as educational institutions schools colleges universities the pace at which the world is changing today governance has changed I remember the long queue in which I used to stand to pay electricity bill for yeah. my home. We don't do that don't now. Do Nobody that. knows even some. So it's not just yeah. property tax, whatever you take. Everything so th- it's not just the tax. workplace. Yeah. The whole world has changed so rapidly. Are we preparing our younger generation for it? Have we changed? Have the schools, the colleges changed? That's the mood question. Yeah, and I want to uh, address that again uh, with you, Partha, and the whole idea of the smartphone generation. and you know use it for good uh, uh, it is of course uh, a source of entertainment as well but uh, they're also learning to use it for good and yet when you go to schools the first thing they do is they ban phones uh, which makes no sense to me because here you have a kid who's constantly on his phone and then he goes to school and it becomes a bad thing why can't we integrate it in our uh, education system not to say that kids will always watch youtube no i mean they can use it for good for learning as well J- just to sorry i i yeah. wanted to add Please. just two years back you said phone is the way to study and suddenly uh, you say you should not be using the phone it's a bad phone. thing so the kid is saying hello what happened no i think it's a, i think it's a, it's our inability to accept change yeah uh I, i saw a very fantastic tweet yesterday i'm sure all of you have been hearing about chat gpt right oh yes and today morning <laughs> we i saw we had a presentation yesterday right <laughs> so today morning i saw a tweet uh, from one of the big researchers in in stanford called andrew ng and he said every teachers are worried about saying homework will be done by kids using chat gpt and he said the teacher's job is to give a homework which is so interesting that yeah. the kid will want to do it himself or yeah. herself yeah. than use chat gpt exactly so i think it's it that is the that is the mindset change with which we have to deal but with but first the teacher will say hello what is chat gpt which comes to a completely different challenge yeah. i think we talked a little bit in the previous yeah. two sessions on on a, on education teachers educators i think that's a big challenge can i 
dwell into that a little yes, bit? Yes, please, even please. Even at the cost of saying that in front of university vice no, chancellors no, no, and UGC I'm chairman. Very open and... Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I saw yeah. that very visible today in the chairman's speech as well, I mean, chairman's talk as well. I, I think there is a fundamental issue in terms of how pedagogy needs to change. Yeah. And in my view, and it's a very narrow view because I've not been an educationist, uh, is that if you look at the current pedagogy, there rests on four pillars. The first pillar is the concept of a classroom. Yeah. And already people have started thinking that will classroom exist or not. Uh, the second and the third concept are in a way linked in this, uh, the, this concept of a syllabus. And along with that, the syllabus is a concept of a proctored exam, yeah. right? A way to assess. And the fourth pillar, in my view, is actually this whole concept of one person knows everything. Yeah. You know, the, the guru kind of stuff. And I think if you look at it today, if you go to any classroom, you have the student in the classroom in the, for the first five minutes, you have the attention. Hmm. After that, the person is physically there is, you have lost the child or the student. Yeah. And I think this has to change. So in each one of this, we'll have, to, we'll have to look at it. When I talked about collaboration, I was just thinking, Maybe all the universities in collaboration with UGC have to come up with saying, what is the new pedagogy that is required? Yeah. And I think unless we are clear with our new pedagogy that is required, we will not be able to train our own teachers to be able to take care of the, of the students. Right. So I think that there is a fundamental challenge I think we are facing. I also, I'm not a, I, oh, let me put it this way. I have to carefully word this. While digital technology is great, especially for learning, I think we have to have a nice balance between what I call as high touch. Without technology, it's high touch, right? You, you touch and you yeah. work closely with people in a classroom environment or a university environment and a high tech. Right. So you have to get a balance right between high tech and high touch. Both extremes are not good. High touch is not good because it's not scalable. And like the chairman pointed out, scalability is extremely important for a country like yeah, ours. Yeah, we need numbers. High tech is also not important because there are lots of other skills. We completely underestimate the importance of soft skills, right? And I think those skills are learned right from day one yeah, in school, Yeah. right? So I think we have to get the balance right between high tech and high touch. Yeah. And that uh, takes me back to schools, really, and how we need to really change right from there. Um, uh, I remember a panel that we had last year when uh, kids were just emerging out of COVID and the principals were saying pe the kids are not even making eye contact anymore because they're so used to uh, looking at their phones. That's how they walk now, you know, they don't even look up and their language has become uh, telegraphic almost. They uh, can't even form complete sentences and they're talking about 16 and 17 year olds in the sense that their sentences have become very uh, you know uh, sort of yeah <laughs> lols uh, and it's not their fault right so uh, there is that happening as well and yet when they go to university suddenly they have to write 2500 word papers they're alarmed how do they do it so i think uh Basically, I mean, just to add to the pedagogy point, uh, uh, you know, there is heterogy that is coming up. The, the way we teach, the way the teaching learning process happens is changing. Right. If you, if you notice, national education policy is also talking about converting the whole process to more learner-centric than teacher-centric. Is the ecosystem ready for it? And we are used to a defined classroom, a defined 40-minute or a one-hour time period, and something the teacher says will what is being taught and hence learned. But here is a generation and here is uh, a compulsion where the learner will decide what he or she needs to learn, will define the curriculum or define the pace at which he or she is going to learn. In higher education, we are also talking about multiple entry and exit. These are all big changes that are happening. Yeah. So are we ready for it? So the way to do it in my view is just go back to basics. As you rightly said, and as uh, you know, I think the UC, UGC chairman also said, go back to basics. And if you are teaching them to be curious, if you are teaching them how to learn rather than teach, that takes them a very long way. I think what needs to be done in schools and in extension to colleges is we should teach them or we should give an environment where they learn. In fact, I'm also reminded by 
some how the original teaching learning process have used to happen yeah. in ancient India. Sri Aurobindo Ghosh says that as holistic learning. He talks about five areas of learning in schools. And we do one of them very well, the others we don't focus. You know, they are as follows. One is the academic learning. Academic learning we focus a lot. There is a curriculum, there are multiple curriculums and we do a reasonably good job on that. He also talks about four other learnings that used to be prevalent and that prepares the children for future. Second is physical. Hmm. So are we training? There are a lot of issues that people face, health and other issues, because the physical learning part, knowing your body and all those. Yeah. The third talks about intellectual learning. It's right. not what you learn in academics. How do you apply that? How do you make sure that what you have learned is something that you can practice or you only go to those areas that you are going to practice. The intellectual part, the, the drive to actually make sure that to derive a meaning out of it and other things is missing. Fourth talks about emotional learning. Mm. That is the time where kids can make mistakes, they can yeah. fail. One of the reasons why we are having issues when they become adolescents and later is, it's very difficult to fail when you are old. Yeah. It's very easy to fail when you are young. The emotional well-being, the emotional learning happens then. The last but not the least, could be debatable a bit, is the spiritual part of it. Yeah. The mental well-being of many of adults is not happening because you're not spiritually trained. So unless, and today, I, I was surprised when some, one of these kids was very worried. So I, one, kids as in, a youngster in my own team in KPMG. So I asked him, what happened? So he said, I posted something in LinkedIn, there is no likes for the past four hours. <laughs> I said, what, for the past four hours, what's wrong? I mean, I mean, there are no likes at all, so some, something must be wrong with me. And he was genuinely dejected. So I think all these five areas, academic, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual well-being will happen only if our school curriculum will start reflecting this. And if you allow the kids to fail and don't punish them for it, yeah, right? Otherwise, how will they Give learn? an environment to fail. Yeah. Let them, uh, you know, stand up after they fail and learn. Yeah. But we don't allow that because we don't have that uh, leeway, right? You know, um, when we talk about careers and jobs, we're also talking about uh, this inbuilt obsolescence, you know? Things that we had even two years ago, we don't have anymore. Things that we don't know will happen two years later. How, how do the kids know, okay, you know, this is something I could do uh, in future, but how do you prepare for it? And what do you think are the jobs of the future? I don't think I can predict the jobs of the future, but what I can predict is many of the skills that we have there will be useless in the future. Right. That means I have to get new skills in the future. Yeah. But I think the, f the point that we need to drill in, 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 into students who are coming through the, through the coursework is that a lot of people get this view saying, you know, I am done with my degree, my learning is over, yeah. for done for life. That concept we have to kill. Because in my view, that's when learning begins. Yeah. Because at the end of your program, that's when your learning begins. So, so moment that mindset is there, and the, and the point that uh, Chris pointed out, it, learning is a two-way street, in the sense that for, for reskilling, for, it is in the organization's interest to ensure its people are upskilled. But it is also a two-way street. The employee also has to get into the mindset that I have to reskill myself, otherwise I will become obsolete. And once you become obsolete, if you get laid off, then you have no reason to point fingers. It's because you were part of that problem as well. The second thing I, I get very worried about is that we are actually, just as a way, I, I, I have a suspicion that we are killing curiosity at different stages, including as parents. Hmm. Right? I always make fun of this, you know, if, you know, if a child keeps on asking questions after yeah, some time, you know, shut up, keep quiet. No, we are killing curiosity. Yeah. It's a very subtle way by which we are killing curiosity. And, I, and it can happen through classrooms, classrooms, lectures, everywhere. Similarly, I get a worrisome feeling that we are suppressing thinking. Mm. And I'll give a small story as an experiment we tried. Um, so when, when we were we used to recruit large number of engineering graduates, so they come out and they come in, into, a, into the company and we run like almost like a finishing school for three months. So I had a few academics who are part of my advisory board. They asked us to do an experiment. It's a very simple 10-minute experiment. Took a lot of months to design it. The experiment was simple. 
this facility where they come in is a large campus. It's a 20-acre campus. And after all the authentication is done, they are identified themselves, you give them a badge. So that means they can go anywhere in the campus. But don't tell them what to do. So this is the first day. They're just coming out of college. They join the company. And they enter in, they're given a badge. And they're not told what to do. And then what happens, we have told all the employees of the company, if somebody comes and asks you, sir, I got my badge, what should I do? Tell them I don't know. <laughs> and this is 350 people. And we put cameras in all direction. And it's very interesting what happened. These are... And so the broad summary, I'm, I'll summarize it now. This happened. There are three groups of people who get formed. One group of people is what I call the cool dudes. You know, the urban variety. They'll come and ask, what do you mean you don't know? You run the place, no? You have to tell me what to do. You know, that aggressive alpha yeah. male behavior. That's about 20% of the people. 50% of the people are the traditional middle class kind of background. Oh, sir, you don't know, sir? Okay, sir, I'll find out. And meekly respond back. There's a third group who are typically studied in a vernacular language, vernacular school, very scared of the first group of people. Right. They meekly go behind the second group and follow whatever that group does. What we had also done in the same campus, we had large displays like this, which showed a path. It says, you have taken the badge, next you go here, next you go here, next you go here, next you go there. Very, very visible, including animation. Not one person looks at that. The point I'm trying to drive is, we are spoon feeding our yeah. people too much. Because of which they don't step back and think. Now, if somebody t gives me a badge and tells me, I'm not going to tell you what to do, shouldn't those students step back and say, why are they doing this? Something must be there, right? Hmm. One, they're not thinking. Second, there's no curiosity. Right. Then somebody will discover the solution. Oh, here is a path. Then there. everybody will follow. In two minutes, oh, everybody knows the everybody. answer. So I'm saying, so I have two concerns as, as educators, we, as parents, we should be worried about. Saying, are we suppressing curiosity too much? And are we suppressing this ability to think on their own? Right. The other point is, uh, you know, um, and it's not necessarily urban, rural. It could, it could even be urban, urban. The divide between the entitled who feel that they deserve it all and perhaps don't need to work very hard for it and the ones who we traditionally call kids with the fire in their bellies, you know? Is that still very much a divide that you see out there? True, there is definitely a divide in terms of And those when they see the entitled kids, you know, getting it all, doing it all, having it all, there is a certain resentment that comes in. In fact, I would think the other way. The fire in the belly part, you know, uh, which is seen more with people who you categorize as those who perhaps didn't have the entitlement. It's very easy to teach those who want to learn than those who Ooh. actually believe that, you know, yeah. they know everything. I and know that it kind all and I can do it all. So we find those people who come from not so privileged environment. And this need not be urban, rural, right? That's what I said. In many yeah. cases, we also find uh, our girls, the women candidates, not forthcoming. Yeah. But we found them, we find them still to be a lot more reliable, a lot more curious and a lot more ability to learn and other stuff. That's because they know that they have to work twice as hard as the men <laughs> to <laughs> get the same thing. <laughs> It's been inbuilt in them. So it's not so much how we divide, but we do see people who have the urge, who have the need, and who have the fire in the belly uh, as a category who perhaps are better learners. But coming back to workplace, I think we need to be, you know, getting used to this diversity in workplace yeah. that I think is not there right now, right? We're talking about a whole new, I think Chris talked about it, what we call as a silver economy coming. We are going to have a lot of old people Yes, and what do together. you do? I'm not going to retire when I'm 60, which is very close. You better not. <laughs> you need to support yourself. You better yourself. find jobs for people like us. I, I, you know, this is going to happen. See, there is a... And survey. there are uh, young kids who are thinking, hello, these uh, old people are not, <laughs> not vacating. And they will continue to do that because India is now in the in that demographic bulge 
and they say till 2047, coinciding with Amrit Kaal, this country is going to have a lot more youngsters than any other country in the world. Yeah. So whether you like or not, old people will have to learn to live with younger people yeah, for many years to come. Uh, yeah, but that's not the point. Things. Point is, the younger people should learn to live with old people. The uh -huh. other way, like because we are going to be around. <laughs> We Whether are going you to work. like it or not, guys. <laughs> We're going to do that. Women are going to be around, which... And women are going to also lead And they are going to numbers. come up much more. Yeah. Because more than 50% of the workforce is women. And I don't think we have leveraged them completely, not just in this country, but definitely in, in India. The third point also is, I think a survey says by 2030, one third of the world's working age population will have origins in India. Now, my question is, are we ready to take on global roles? Yeah. We are willy-nilly, mostly the youngsters here, are going to serve global audience. That doesn't mean they'll physically travel there. Yeah. It could yeah, happen out of true. here. It could, the globalization part, are we mentally ready to adjust to these things? And it's not just the accent, it's not just the culture. There are many other things that are going to be different. So this diversity in the workplace is something that I don't think we are used to. We're slowly getting used to. And that's going to be a defining feature of how it's going to happen in future. So I the think old is, white, old, old males, the older males have to get used to it because they're mostly in positions they, of they leadership have the right time. now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the point you're making is that diversity is all along we only thought about gender. Yeah. It's now talking about generational, yeah. generational diversity. Beyond that. Yeah. But, but I have a little diff different take on this. It's not about young people learning to adjust with the older generation or older people able to adjust with the generation, younger generation. It is what does each one of them bring to the table, hmm. right? If I am working in an organization, I'm working in a team, we have a goal, what do you bring to the table? Right. And how can you tell the younger people or, or the younger person tells you that this is what I bring to the table? I think that mindset we'll have to get into. I think age should not be a factor in deciding anything. It is a, what is a value add I'm able to make to the team, to the organization, to the group. That is what should be the driving factor and we have to push in that direction. Right. And if in it's fact, not the me, group, if it's the gig economy, if you're working yeah. on your own. In fact, let yeah. me add to the yeah. diversity question. You're going to have machines do a lot more work than what it is happening today. Yeah. When I say machines, it's not very, chat GPT is just one of them. Exactly. Now, how many of us know how to live with chat GPT? and make the best out of it. Either we are scared or we are overtly like, you know, leaning on to it and saying it will pass examinations and things like that. But this is going to be a fact of life. Tomorrow when you walk out, machines are going to be part of your life in everything that you do in from, you know, your regular cooking to walking out to going to office, helping your office assistants are going to be machines. So this man-machine interface and that is a big diversity that we are not used to. The gig workers are the other diversity. Today, I don't know how to handle when somebody says, I'll give you four hours of, uh, yeah. how do I work with them? I'm used to an employee who's like, you know, being there. 930 a, leaves and, and doesn't leave. And moonlighting is a bad word. Yeah. And you, in the future, that's how it's going to be. Yeah. You're going to say like, you know, I'll give you 10 hours this week. You try and use it. Yeah. So these are the diversities. Diversity is not just about gender. Yeah. A whole bunch of diversities. Are we prepared for it? Most importantly, in educational institutions, are we preparing them for this? Right. That's going to be important. Yeah. I just want to add one point on this whole machine, man-machine stuff. You know, Woman-machine. Human machine. Sorry, human, no, machine. human machine, sorry. So I, I studied computer science 100 years back. <laughs> so at that time, of, my professor told me that artificial intelligence is coming in. And you know, all you software engineers will lose your jobs very quickly. I'm still waiting for the day. <laughs> but I think, again, the statement was made by one of the leading artificial intelligence researchers a couple of months back. It is like, you know, there's a saying, right? It's not in, in the political world. It's not about what you know, but whom you know. Whom you know. <laughs> right? I think the same thing applies for this as well. It is, one is what you know, and what you know exists that you can use effectively. Right. So I think knowing what is there, that these are all should be seen as tools that you can effectively use so that you become much more productive than anybody else. Right. Fact so I, it is not that artificial intelligence is going to take away jobs, but lack of knowledge of artificial intelligence and what exists yeah. is what is going to make you obsolete. Uh, on, a, on a lighter note, they say artificial intelligence is gaining ground because there is native stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Once we get out of it,
We can harness the artificial intelligence to the best. Two questions, quick. Yes, please, quickly, quickly. Hello, sirs. Hello, ma'am. This is uh, Somdatta Majumdar, and I'm from Great Lakes Institute of Management. So, uh, you were talking about the kind of education we have today. And Swami Vivekananda famously said that character building should be the hallmark of education. But mostly we sit in class and learn theoretical education that helps us make money. And we don't have any skills to cope with life at all. For example, we have ousted home economics that gave us valuable education about personal finance, first aid, nutrition, etc. We don't have any mental health training or uh, socialization training. So don't you think there should be a plan in place to integrate this into our mainstream education system? Thank you. I think we should. That's what I said. The holistic education is something that we should think through. And with no, uh, whatever, like, you know, offense meant, we are talking about highly of curriculums outside, like IB, like other things at a school level, because they try and provide some parts of the holistic part of it, at least the experiential and other things. It is time, I know there are many eminent people here from other regulators as well, it's time we rethink education, not just change it a little bit, rethink education as to how do we make it that is more going back to basics and preparing people for the world rather than 40 minute period that happens eight times a day, we've completed the subject right. and we're through with it. And the first uh, casualty is the PE period always. Yeah. Physical education. Uh, I, I, I think it's a great point that young lady made. I think we have to start thinking about saying there has to be a certain set of, uh, I won't call them skills, but you know, life, life readiness life, yeah. and work readiness. Lot of focus is there on work readiness hmm. because it's the interest of the organization to make them ready at work. But life readiness, you know, personal finance, for example, yeah. or taking care of your health, for example, is not a focus area. And sometimes by the time you realize it, it's too late. Yeah. This, the other important aspect I think she didn't touch upon, I think it's important to also have some guardrails around morals and ethics. Yeah. Sometimes when I go to in deep interiors of the country and talk to people, I get this feeling, you know, these guys will do anything. Yeah, they have a can-do attitude, but they'll also cross lines, break rules and go overboard. So I think some guardrails need to be built in their mindset as well, saying, you know, you, you have this can-do attitude, but there are certain broad societal boundaries and you can't cross. I think that also should be part of, you know, life readiness and work readiness as we move forward. Yeah. One more question quickly. Yes. Sorry. Uh, hi, sir. This is Dr. Kishan from Savita University. Uh, I have a question. Originally, we were talking about layoffs. So how can we see that? Uh, will this uh, it'll drastically affect our economy? Or uh, will this uh, boost our economy by bringing broom in uh, entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. No, I think like Chris pointed out, um, you know, this, this layoffs and going through ups and downs, I think it's part of economy. As we grow as an economy, I think we have to learn to, this is the reality of the world. At the end of the day, businesses are there to make money. Just as a way, and that's a reality. So if, they, if they're going to get affected, they will do whatever it takes to protect. I, and I think... In the overall scheme of things, like what Chris pointed out, I think it's a very, very small thing. It's taking the headlines right now. Uh, but, but I don't think, like I said, if somebody loses the job, they, that person should think, the company lost me, I have 10 other places to go. That confidence that each one of us will have, should have. And the moment that happens, we will not be worried about layoffs. Layoffs are not new in the world. They are new to India, because this is part of our growing up. Now, should everybody else become an entrepreneur? I don't agree with that. I think, in my view, entrepreneurship is over-romanticized in our country. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, very difficult, difficult very job. Tough. <laughs> not everybody is cut out to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right? So I, I don't think, and we should not, we are very good at creating this perception ladders, yeah. right? I, I used to, in the software industry, you say, oh, I am a developer, you are a tester. So you quickly say, I am here, you are there. Right. So I, similarly, today I see in IITs that, you know, you say, oh, you're taking a job? Oh, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right? I think these kind of perception ladders we should kill. Everything has its place in the world. And I think different people are cut out for different roles. Right. Wonderful. Okay, quickly, quickly. A teacher, I think. Yeah, quick, quick, quick. Yeah. 
Namaskar. It was a very, very inspiring uh, session. Regarding the curriculum that you are all thinking to add in educational system, is there any thought about including Mahabharata, Ramayana, or the Bhagavad Gita as a very integral part of learning? Because recently there was a video that I saw where the external um, uh, minister, Dr. Jayashankar, mentioned that the greatest diplomats were Sri Krishna and Sri Hanuman, and we have a lot to learn from them. I don't think I'm even competent to answer <laughs> this question. I'll be honest here. Maybe you have a point of view. Yeah, so uh, there are two ways of looking into it. One, I think there is a lot of pride. There is a lot of learnings from the past. It's not... There are many countries who don't even have a history beyond 300 years. And we are a country who we don't even know when history started. Yeah. So it is a shame if we as students don't know what is our own past. And second, past teaches us a lot. We, we forget that. Past teaches us so many things about what we can do and what we cannot do. And some of the epics that you said are very rooted in what happens in our country. So rather than looking at these things as religious texts or anything in that yeah. connotation, of course it is true, but we should also start looking at it. One, are we going back to our ethos, learning what has happened? And second, genuinely, like Dr. Jayashankar also put, they have a lot of stuff that they teach us which somehow we forget. So in both sense, I think we should bring them in, uh, blend them very naturally as a part of it, rather than put them separately as some augmented studies or social and things like that. My Wonderful. View. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was a lovely discussion.